gonna have a lot of fun tonight, guys. Um, you know, I'm so glad I got to come in here and talk about aliens for a little bit, um, but I feel like I need to introduce myself a little bit for people who don't know me. Um, I have been attending this church for 17 years. Um, it's crazy, I started coming here when I was three, so clearly super young, and uh, I'm a little bit older. And <laughs> my name is Rachel Ceballos, it used to be Rachel Collins, but I married the super hot worship leader uh, guy in the back, so uh, changed that last name, you know what I mean? Um, I've been working for 10 years on staff here with junior high, high school, and mainly college and young adults, and it is a huge blessing. Um, and being married to Joel Ceballos, um, you can see he's just the cutest thing ever. Um, and we are so stoked that this November we're welcoming our little guy. Um, yes! Helping, helping to build CCV one person at a time. And um, what's really fun is that this weekend we have started a whole new series called Unreality. Um, it began this week, this morning, um, and it's looking through the Bible at real people, through the scriptures, at their stories. Um, and I love it because the Bible is full of the unedited, raw, and honest glimpses into human nature. It's really like reality TV. Um, and I like trashy reality television. I feel like I have to admit it to you. Um, I like hoarders. So basically, you know, like that one show where it makes you just, it's itchy, um, it's uncomfortable, but it's real. Um, I also love The Bachelorette. Please don't judge me. Um, Jojo, I think she picked terribly. Um, and they're all really train wrecks of life. Um, and you can't stop watching. And that's what it is about reality television. Um, one of my favorites that's been going on for many, many years is one called True Life on MTV. I don't know if many of you guys have ever seen it. Um, it's been going on for like 10 years. And it's following people and their stories, documentary style, um, and just really seeing what's going on. Some of them, let me give you some titles. One is called I'm Married to a Stranger, super classy. Um, one is called I Had My Cousin's Baby, clearly want to watch that. Um, another one is I'm Preparing for the End of the World, check. And then another one, I Live My Life as a Cat, clearly a nail biter. And I think that's and I know all of you guys, there's a lot of you who may not like reality television, but there's a part of us that wants to know what's going on in the lives of people, what's going on in the lives of families. Um, I have a lot of my family here tonight. They're over there. They're super loud. Um, and I feel like all of them, that's, that could be an episode all on its own right there. My grandma is so cute. Um, hers could be, I make the best gravy and I'm super adorable. And everyone would watch it. Um, but when it comes down to it, I as a pastor, as someone here, I want to know what makes people tick. I want to know what's behind the stories, the smiles, what's going on in their lives that every day they wake up and, man, what's the reality behind the unreality? What's your heartbreak? Don't you want to know that? You want to know people deep down what makes them just feel joy, feel pain, their deepest hurts and fears. It's the real, real. That's what we call it. I want to know the real, real about all of you. And I feel like deep down, it's something that God has created us to be, to live, to go past the facade, to go past the kind of people who only know the surface level. And I believe that a lot of us, you and me together, we're asking a lot of the same questions of, do I have a place in this world? Who am I in this world? Where is my home? Am I welcomed into it? And I think deep down, all of us at one point or another have asked these questions or are continually asking them to ourselves right now. One really interesting cultural phenomenon that's happening is um, a lot of you guys probably watch things on YouTube, right? Everybody watches YouTube here and there, cat videos, a lot of different stuff. And um, there's a huge following for watching families online just random families. There's these people called Ellie and Jared Meacham, and they have almost a million subscribers on YouTube to watch them do things like take their kids to the doctor's appointment, um, to go to Babies R Us and pick up a few supplies, their backyard barbecue, just normal everyday family life. And they have a million subscribers for it. And they have, I mean, they're making Google ad money left and right. And you wonder why would anybody want to watch the everyday mundane kind of life? And in my opinion, 
I think that it comes from this deep down desire for people who maybe come from broken or hurting families or who are searching for these things to watch families that seem really tight-knit and living together and it's comforting to see this family unit being brought together. And so I think for you and me, wherever you may be in this journey, I believe tonight that God is gonna speak through his word to you and me. That there is a story and a person and a power in his word. And so I wanna quickly just pray for us right now for wherever you may be in this journey that God will speak to us in this room. Let's pray. Father God, I am so thankful to be here with this Sunday night group that loves you, Lord, for those that are on different parts of the journey. And I know there are some people in this room right now who have struggled with family. They have struggled with wondering what your plan is for their life. And I just ask tonight that you will speak to their hearts through your word in a powerful way that inspires us to know that you, God, are right here with us, that you have a plan and that we can trust you. We love you, God. We thank you for this opportunity. And all of God's people said, amen. The person that I want to focus on tonight, the real true life person out of the scriptures is a guy named Mephibosheth. So clearly the easiest name that I could pick in the Bible. I've been calling him Mephibo all week. Um, I probably won't do it. We're just going to work it together. But Mephibosheth is quite a mouthful. Do you guys want to try to say it? Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth. Great job, guys. It's rough. Um, and we need to give a little bit of background, though, before we get to him. And the background goes into the Old Testament. We're going to be in 2 Samuel 9 tonight. But in the background of the Old Testament, you're going to see there was a man by the name of Saul. And you've probably heard of him. He was the first king of Israel. And he wasn't the best kind of guy. He was intensely jealous of a young man by the name of David. David was good friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. And when they were young, they had made a pact. They had made a pact, Jonathan and David, that they would always care for each other's family. And what had happened is, is that Saul's anger towards David, his jealousy caused him to want to kill David. And he wanted to do it by bringing him to his table. Because Saul was king at that time, he wanted to bring him to the table and he wanted to murder him. But Jonathan, Saul's son, saved David's life by warning him. And Jonathan even abandoned his place at his father's kingly table to do so. When we look in 1 Samuel 20, 34, you're going to see that Jonathan rose from the table in a fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. It is a big, big deal to leave the family table, for them to reject all the things that his father had done. It was, it was an ultimate disgrace. Now, when I think about tables, you're probably wondering, how did I find this beautiful piece of craftsmanship here to my right? This is actually my table and chairs from my house. Um, my sweet husband strapped it to the top of his Kia and drove it here. And I tried to get video because it was awesome. Um, when me and Joel got married, you know, clearly like married people, we went to the place where we could buy furniture and that was Ikea. And this entire setup $99, <laughs> right? Um, you can't put too much liquid on it because it'll warp. Um, things that are too heavy, concerningly shaky. Whenever I sit here at the table, it's always like, oh, more and more pregnant I get, more concerning will this hold my weight. And it is, um, it is a fine piece of Swedish craftsmanship, um, but it's, it's kind of a piece of crap, you gotta be honest. And I, I love that deep down, that someday though, this actual table is going to be where we feed our little baby, our little guy. That this will be a place where we come together when he eats his first foods and when he is together here with us and screaming and yelling and making a mess and that we'll have these memories and that this table that sits on the stage is gonna come back with us in one piece, God willing, and we're gonna have this time together as a family. And each one of you probably come from a home where you had a place that you came together and it was really important. Tables are important to us. And we're gonna keep going with this, but I wanna get back to David. I wanna get back to this guy because later down the road, David becomes king. After Saul and Jonathan are gone, and a lot of Saul's family had been killed, David was the one who took the throne. And you can see that there had been a lot to get to this point. But as the king, 
David begins to ask the question, is there anyone from the line of Saul, this man who tried to kill him, anyone in that family, are they still alive? And as a king, that's a big request. And the only one that is left from the line of Saul is Mephibosheth, this guy. And we want to get to his backstory. In 2 Samuel 4.4, 4, we learn a little bit about who this guy is. It says, Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Literally, his name, the name Mephibosheth means from the mouth of a shameful thing. Could not get more rough of a name. This, everything that you say, everything that it means, this guy had it rough. He also lived in an area that was incredibly distant, far, off in the desert, away from civilization. He lived in the modern day Bakersfield to us. Mephibosheth was from a rough, rough area. Sorry, all those from Bakersfield, but you know it. I'm sorry, it's rough. He's from Bakersfield. So he's from this area and it's really far off. And he's been left in this place where ultimately they didn't think that he was any type of problem because he'd been found lame. He was deserted. All of his family had been killed. He's living off in the remotest part of civilization. And you can just see that this guy has been forgotten. And you see David begin to ask. In 2 Samuel 9, one through six, in the key verses that we're looking at here tonight, this is David speaking, and David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant, clearly. And the king said, is there not still someone in the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, there's still a son of Jonathan, he is crippled in his feet. And pausing here, you can see that this guy who'd been a part of Saul's kingdom, who had been a servant to him, is basically saying, okay, you know, uh, there is someone, I'm gonna answer you, I'm your servant, but nah, he's crippled. Basically, like, leave the guy alone. You don't need to come after him. He's not a worry for you, leave him alone. And David, you can imagine, here he is, as the king is beginning to ask questions. He begins to probably remember the agreement, the covenant that he'd made with his old friend Jonathan to take care of his family. And we see here in Mephibosheth, in the verses in six, verse six, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, he came to David and he fell on his face and he paid homage. I cannot imagine how this poor guy, the things he's been through, and he's probably freaking out at this point. Many kings would search for the lines of people who had ever disobeyed them to kill them, to kill them in a horrible, horrible way. That this is the last line of the descendants who'd been against him. And you can just see that maybe Mephibosheth is just in front of the king wondering how he got here and maybe he's shuffling, maybe he's even being carried because he cannot walk straight into David's throne, trembling probably in fear, his sufferings, everything he's been through, it's affected his sense of personal esteem. And David has all the control here. Every bit of it. Is it death? Is it kindness? He said kindness. Is this what he means? And in 2 Samuel 9, verses 6 through 8, I love this. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, and he fell on his face, and he paid homage, and David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, what is it, your servant, that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? And I love that there is an honesty, there is a realness that this man has been through so many things and he is so honest with the fact that he even calls himself a dead dog. This is how he feels, filled with shame. Shame, crippled physically, orphaned. Life had treated Mephibosheth so rough, his family rough. The reality of his life is like a train wreck of the ultimate TV reality show. And there's a pause here because 
you start to think about how do you fit into this? How do we begin to see ourselves in the story of Mephibosheth? And it takes me back to a few years ago. Um, I got to lead, help lead a trip with my friend JP uh, to Haiti. Um, we took a bunch of students, college students, a bunch of people, and we went to um, probably one of the roughest places that I've ever been. Uh, it was a compound in the middle of just the most intense poverty that I've ever seen. And there was this community there that helped take in orphaned special needs children. It was a whole part of it, and it was called the Miriam Center. And they would also get developmentally, um, developmental issue children that couldn't be taken care of by their families. And so the Miriam Center was full of these kids who were just filled with life, but had some of the most serious needs that here in the States would have been really well taken care of, but there it's hard to get anything. And there was a boy who stole my heart. His name is T. Stevenson. T meaning small, so little Stevenson. And um, he had been born without a thyroid. Look at him. I am just done. Look at this. This is, he's probably about six years old here. What's interesting is that without a thyroid, he never grew larger than this. You can see he didn't have teeth. Um, he didn't speak. He had no ability to communicate. Um, he was really the size of a 10-month-old baby. Um, and when I had met him, um, I had found out a little bit of his story was that um, at a young age, he was handed over to a witch doctor there in Haiti um, because they believed that he was cursed because he didn't grow. They burned his skin with matches. They used him in various voodoo rituals. Um, they cut his skin. Um, and at one point, they had just left him outside to die. And by God's hand, um, he ended up alive at the mission and at the Miriam Center. And when I got there, he had been there for a while, um, but I got to see this little guy who loved to be held. They found that he loved, you put lotion on him, just loved to be cuddled, um, and he just would have that smile that would light up a room. And it was just really, to me, an actual glimpse of heaven, um, this sweet little guy. And I can't imagine the suffering he experienced at the hands of other people. I cannot imagine the physical ailments, and there's no part of me that can even um, try to, because from where I stand, those things are not a part of my story. But for a moment, he was brought in to a place, a home, where he got restoration. It was literally put into his bones. He was given a home, a place to be. And when I think of Mephibosheth, I think we can only imagine how he had felt abandoned by God, wondering if his cries were ever heard, that in the midst of his pain and his despair and the feelings of abandonment and loneliness and pain, many of us also have these questions. We ask God, when will you make things right? When will you make it right for these kids? When will you make it for me and my life? And I've been trying to find a job. I've been trying to do these things. And God, there's this pain and I'm injured and I'm hurt. And I wonder, where are you in the midst of it? And I want to read this part to you again. In 2 Samuel 9, verses 9 through 11, just this Old Testament view that's so powerful that the king, he called Ziba, Saul's servant, and he said to him, all that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson, and you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. In all of this, the power of the story is that David has not only restored Ziba, Saul's line, shown a kindness that can never be repaid, but he restored Mephibosheth. The kindness that is mentioned over and over in these verses, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, it's called hesed. You guys want to say it with me? Hased. It's a good one. It feels like a balm covering the room. Hased, this kindness. It's used to describe someone who is good. And I love this because David, in all of this, he could have been the king who said, I'm not going to follow anything that I said. I'm going to kill everybody. I'm going to make sure that my rule is known, that I am king, I stand in power. And here's what he did to the person who could never repay it, to the person who was so far and so away from any ability to do these things, he welcomed him in. David reminds us of God, who is welcoming us into his home, to share in God's wealth, to sit at his table. David's heart is found in the heart of God. And through this kindness, man, it's a kindness that is felt 
even more than it's being seen or heard. Because we all know that we like kind words, right? There's nothing like when someone's like, oh, you look so good today. You go, well, thank you so much. Like, oh, look at that person. Oh, you are, let me just tell you that you, I just see it on you. Oh, okay, feeling it, right? But when someone does something for you that you can never repay, when there is someone who shows you a kindness that you have in no way earned, you've been a jerk all day, and they still treat you with kindness, Joel Ceballos happens all the time. It is that deep love that comes out when I'm like, I don't even, des-. and it's, it's a love that is indescribable. When I think about the table, because this is where it takes me, I call it table theology, and people have brought this up before, but when you think about a table, like we had said from the beginning, it's where all of our biggest moments are lived, right? If someone dies, you come home and you sit around the table. When someone is born, you bring that baby in and you sit and you eat. Holidays, again, bring out the mashed potatoes, bring the pumpkin pie, like we're gonna do this. Everyone, you know your role, you know your job. We're gonna sit and we're gonna eat. And if someone comes in who's brand new, what do you do? Oh, you better get another table. Then we will squidge. We will put a spot here at the table. We're going to feed you. The table is a part of our culture. It's a part of who we are. Life is done around the table, right? In this place, in your houses, in your home, your $99 Ikea, or the one that your grandma gave you, or the huge one, or the tiny, whatever it is. We want people to have a seat at our table. If we love someone, we want to share life with them. We want them to be a part of what we're doing. When you look at it through, um, through the heart lens, you can see that there's some amazing pictures of life at the table. The famous one, right? Norman Rockwell, where there's like the turkey, and like I love the one guy with just his eyes peeking out the corner, like he's like, that's my turkey. Like I love that there's, that there's this, you know, it's kind of idealistic, but doesn't it hit you? Like that's why we love the holidays, right? Because you come together, you eat too much. The next one you can see, it's Jesus with his disciples. Jesus understood that a shared table is a shared life. Let me put this up on the screen. Jesus understood that a shared table is a shared life. Jesus sat at his table with the weirdest people, the wildest, the strangest collection that you could ever imagine. People thought that it was not real, that he would sit with sinners, and Jesus never apologized for it. Who he brought into his table were tax collectors. He hung out with the lowest of the low. And I believe that it's one of the things, obviously, that we can see that got him killed. You can tell a lot about a person by who they make a spot for at their table. That's you and me included. I wanna read this really beautiful quote from a great author that I know. Um, in, in her book, Searching for Sunday, written by her name is Rachel Held Evans, she says, when talking about the story of the great banquet from Luke 14, she writes, this is what God's kingdom is like. A bunch of outcasts and oddballs gathered at a table, not because they are rich or worthy or good, but because they are hungry, because they said yes, and there's always room for more. She also writes, there are always folks who fancy themselves bouncers to the heavenly banquet, charged with keeping the wrong people away from the table and out of the church. But the gospel doesn't need a coalition devoted to keeping the wrong people out. It needs a family of sinners saved by grace, committed to tearing down walls, throwing open doors. Sometimes the most radical act of Christian obedience is to share a meal with someone new. The table can transform even our enemies into companions. Oh, amen. That is some preach, but the, you hear, Jesus spent his last night on earth with his disciples around that table, breaking bread that he would later call his body, pouring out the wine that would later be representative of his blood together. Mephibosheth, when we go back, his restoration was being found welcomed into that very table. And we speed back over to Jesus, who welcomes all of us to his table. You and me in this room to let go of our shame, because whatever we carry, whatever things we have on our back right now, we are called to sit at Jesus' table. And when you sit at the table with someone, what you recognize is you're at the same level. There is no part of me that is higher or lower than anyone around me. I am sitting here as one person recognizing that I am in need, 
I'm in need to be fed. I need to be with people. I'm a part of something bigger. I need a home. I need a family. The things that our hearts cry out for, you sit at this table and you begin to recognize it because it's a sad place to sit alone. We have glimpses of heaven this side of earth. The restoration that Jesus offers is here and now. When we eat, when you took communion and you remembered his body broken and that blood poured out, we will someday sit at an even bigger and better banquet table in heaven with him. And there's joy in that. Just last year, little T. Stevenson, that sweet boy um, who experienced so much pain, he went home um, to Jesus. And I think that for me, there's a sadness in knowing that he left this earth, but there's a great joy because I can imagine he went into heaven fully restored. He was able to walk into heaven, walk, to be the little man or grown man that he, he should have been, that everything was healed and whole. Welcomed into that great banquet table in heaven. And even for a little bit, he got to have a little bit of heaven here on earth for every person who held him and cuddled him and rubbed a little lotion on his body and his feet. But there is something in all of us that knows that there's something missing. There's a part of us that know that we are called to something bigger and greater, and that even in this room, that this world does not have everything that we need. This world may have glimpses of heaven, but there is a greater call on our lives. This church, you and me in this room, we're a part of a table. When you look around, I love it. We're the church, y'all. Like when people say, oh, I go to church, it's you. You and me, guys, it ain't this building. It's you and me in this room. And when you come around, the church is people who sit here. And I love it because it's a family. Take a look at the people around you. Guys, that's your aunties, your uncles, your crazy cousin who you barely call, but you love. Look around because you're all a part of something bigger. And we are called to this table. Every time we take communion, we're at the table. Every time we go home, we remember what communion is, that we're bringing the table to whoever we bring to our table. We are supposed to be meeting and inviting and praying for people that are far from God to sit with people who are different from us. We here at CCV have been talking a lot about vision. We've spent weeks on it. And if you've been here, we talked about that there is no plan B for reaching people for Christ. It's through us that God wants to use us to reach other people. How terrifying, right? When you think of all the people in your life who are far from the Lord, and maybe it's you, it's scary, right? A little bit scary? Here's what I love is that Jesus breaks it down real simple. You take them to your table. You feed them. You show kindness. You let them know we're on the same field. We're on the same level. I'm not higher or lower than you. And the only thing I have figured out is there is a God who is greater than me. And if I'm called to be a part of this church, then I'm called to fill in the seats next to me. I'm called to be the kind of person who cannot stop talking about the fact, hey, there's this little boy. His name was T. Stevenson. And he was abused and he was hurt because this world is rough. But he now sits in heaven at the right hand next to God at his table with Jesus Christ guiding and healing him. There is something bigger and better and you know it in your heart, just like I do. This is what we're called to share. If God is gonna work through us, we've gotta let him. We're called in this place to let go of our shame. Whatever you are carrying, some of you think that you don't have a spot at the table that God's called you. Oh, I don't know what it is, but I know in all of us, when we look at these deep, dark, bachelorette, reality TV, we look at this kind of stuff, we're drawn into the muck and the mire because inside of us, some of us really carry some dark stuff. And we've carried it like a backpack on our backs. Whatever the shame, the resentment, the guilt, it keeps us away from community. It keeps us alone and from the table. But it is God's grace, the kindness we have never deserved, that's what it is, that has welcomed us in right now, who we are, as we are, he's calling us to the table. That kindness, I don't deserve it. It's drawing me in. We can never repay. We are called to this restoration. We sit equal. 
I wanna read this last verse here and let this be almost like our prayer over us tonight that we remember here in the Old Testament and jumping here into the new. In 2 Corinthians chapter four, verses seven through nine, it says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Can I hear an amen in this place? Because that is the truth. What, what is God calling you and me to do with this? When you look at these things, it's a nice sermon. Okay, Rachel, I feel like the table, oh, I got it. What are we called to do? Let's make it real for a second. What family or friends in your life right now have been estranged for you and you have to figure out a way to welcome them back to the table? Have you possibly in this room had a super hard heart toward others recently? Like when you think about it, you're like, I hate everybody. (laughs) People different than you, people who disagree with you, people who vote differently than you. Maybe God, someone got it over there. Someone is calling you God to share a meal with them. Bring it down to the same level the same breath that runs through you, the same blood, the lungs calling you. Or like I said, there's some of you maybe in this room who have let shame, a physical ailment, a bad family past or current struggles to cause you to be alienated from God, from his table, from his community, from his people, from him. And right now in this place, he is welcoming you back to the table to come to his restoration in the same way that we look at Mephibosheth and he probably thought nothing could bring him home. Nothing could restore what had been taken from him. He was called by the very man who had no reason to show him kindness to set him into a place of honor and safety and restoration because that's what God does. Healing is alive and well in God's presence and that's the truth that rests on this place. Let me pray for us. Lord, we are so unworthy of the kindness that you have shown us. You have treated us as your sons and daughters, and even though there are times when sin has run rampant in our life, when we have got caught up in so many things of this world, Lord, the things that break your heart, that ensnare us, there's so many things, Lord, that we have focused on, everything but you. And tonight we come back and we look at the power of the table and we want to be a part, Lord, of your kingdom. We wanna be a part of what you are doing on this earth, Lord. Help heal us, help restore us, help us to be the kind of people that not only take that restoration into ourselves, but we invite others to join us, God, to be a part of what's so much greater than what this world has to offer. We are thankful, God, for your church. I'm thankful for the people in this room who are wrestling through things in their life right now, and they are wondering how and where are you? And Lord, you are here to say in a powerful voice, I am here, I am here with you always, and I have a plan for your life. Thank you, God, for loving us, for letting us be a part of your family. We thank you for this opportunity tonight um, to just dive into your word, and we just pray, um, just a special blessing, Lord, over those right now who are, who are in those dark places, God. And we just ask that your spirit does a mighty, mighty work. We love you. And all of God's people in this place said, amen.